I'm getting better every video and with every subscriber. And it's not just me noticing my improvement in video quality since purchasing the M3 MacBook Pro. It's you, you're noticing it as well. And while it's my propensity to fixate and scour YouTube to study and learn things on any given topic in any given day, that in conjunction with purchasing new products and making sure that I've got quality equipment surrounding me to make sure my message is heard in the best format possible, the M3 Pro MacBook Pro is at the center of all of that, the center of the slow burn of a YouTube channel that I've created, as it's one of the most successful videos that I've had so far, and all the research that I've done on anything video related over the past few months has been on this M3 Pro MacBook Pro. I've been writing scripts, editing videos, watching YouTube videos, all of which has been a real dream, both literally and figuratively. And so I said in my last video, pro machines won't make you a pro. What they will do is they'll stay out of your way while you work to be the pro that you aim to be. Contrary to that statement, I feel like the M3 Pro MacBook Pro is making me a pro. So I think I can answer quite a bit of the questions I had in that last video by giving you a real world, real life benchmark. Instead of getting into specs, figured I would break down many of the questions I got in that previous video and share some simple philosophies that can help you all out if you're interested in this machine or if you currently have it, as well as answer one question that I got that was probably one of the most eye-opening questions I've really had. So let's just go on ahead and get into it. For starters, I wanna set the tone a little bit. The M3 Pro is not mid-tier. It is not a middle-tier CPU. Despite its placement in the CPU lineup, it's not actually a mid-tier machine. The M3 Pro is still a professional-grade machine. It shares the same trackpad, keyboard, chassis, display, ports, as its bigger brother, the Max. So there's certainly some overlap, but there's still some advantage to that Max chip. But I think because the Max exists, a lot of people forget that the M3 Pro and really the M1 Pro and M2 Pro are still professional chips. And in isolation, they're incredible achievements in computational density. I saw oftentimes in the comments that people felt the need to be stair-stepped into the Max. And I felt that too when I was purchasing the M3 Pro because we have this innate desire to get the most for our money. And that's kind of how the spec wars and how these YouTube videos typically make you feel. So I wanna share some simple principles with you that I hope guides you in a logical direction rather than the spec peeping purchasing that goes on in today's market. And the first simple question I think you should ask yourself is, would you take performance that you might not ever use over battery life that you certainly will use? And how does it help you to pay for something like that? So I learned early on that you don't have to eat the hot dog you purchased when your stomach's hurting. Just because you put money there, it doesn't mean you need it. So you ask yourself this, do you ditch the hot dog, you lose your $5, but in the long run you'll feel better? Or do you maximize that $5 and eat that hot dog and then subsequently make your stomach a lot worse? Now that doesn't really help your situation out at all. So how does that relate to the MacBook? And what does that have to do with anything that we're just talking about? Well, people feel the need to spend more money when they're already spending a lot of money. They want to get it while they're in there. And I understand that because with the MacBooks, there's not much upgradability there. But I think people fall into this thought process that they need to get the most performance while they're there and pay extra money to get the Max chip just because Apple has stair-stepped it that way. But if people would just stop for a second, focus, do what works for you, do what's best for you, and don't feel the need to buy something that's not made for you. But if you like hot dogs more than your stomach hurts, you enjoyed that max process or you lucky son of a gun i wanted one too i just couldn't swing for one it'd be pretty unlikely that you'd really notice any battery difference in isolation and i don't think you'd be disappointed in owning a max machine so there's really nothing wrong with either machine one thing i think people forget though is that the pro has plenty of power just because the max exists it doesn't mean that the pro is any less efficient any less performant fundamentally don't feel like you have to upgrade to the max chip that's what apple would want you to do but don't feel like you have to especially if you don't need it there was this underlying message i had in my original m3 pro video and maybe my quality hadn't caught up to the message at the time but it was the question of who is the m3 pro for and the crazy thing is the m3 pro is for everyone and that includes professionals now as we get into this i think there's some honorable mentions all the pro chips are made for pros no one should feel like they're getting any lesser because maybe they got the lower bend version of a pro chip or because they ended up not getting the max chip and just got a pro chip all of them are insane in terms of their performance all of them are and that's why even the m1 pro is still a viable option in 2024 and that's just essentially essentially because these pro chips aren't pro for one year and then done. It just doesn't work like that. Now, with that out of the way, I think we should get into another thing that kind of causes a little bit of confusion about the M3 Pro and really the M3 lineup in general. And that is the fact that there's some confusion around the M2 Pro's performance versus the M3 Pro's performance. And there are definitely some specs that can show you that the M2 Pro might be a little bit better in some situations. They have more GPU cores, for instance. They have more memory bandwidth. All of these things probably aren't English to the average person, but nonetheless, they're specs that might be important. 
To me, it really matters of how they materialize in the real world and in your usage. But overall, the M3 Pro is a better chip in terms of user experience and on average, it's gonna be a perfectly adequate chip, especially for the average users in areas where it really matters. So let's go over some of the objective truths here. The M2 Pro and the M3 Pro were both made available in the same year. The fact that you can even remotely scale up the performance of the M2 Pro in the same year essentially is kind of crazy. Number two, the write speeds are faster on the M3 Pro, which is great, for general usability. It's always a nice experience to have faster storage. The battery is better on the M3 Pro. It should be. It was always my assumption that it would be. As a matter of fact, I care more about battery life because I thought the M1 Pro had plenty of performance for me. So really the battery to me was more important when I purchased the device. It's on a three nanometer process now and thus it should be more efficient. That's not always the case, but that's the spec that would materialize into a real world experience smaller nanometer process typically yields higher performance per watt, meaning it's more efficient. So that seems to be the case with the M3 Pro. That's something that really benefits the average user of these machines. The display is better on the M3 Pro. Don't get me wrong, the M2 Pro display is awesome. I mean, it's, it's good. There was nothing wrong with it, so there's not really any reason to improve or iterate on it. And really, I don't think it's that much better. It's maybe 20% brighter or something crazy. So objectively though, the display is better on the M3 Pro. If you put them in isolation, you wouldn't notice though. And the GPU, here's where we get some kind of a toss up, especially in the top end of the M3 Pro, I think the GPU is probably better, particularly if you're thinking about ray tracing. In general, for the average user, the GPU on the M3 Pro is probably a better bet than the M2 Pro. And I saw some benchmarks that showed the M2 Pro doing better. I saw some benchmarks that saw the M3 Pro doing better. Both of them are really good. Now, another thing, the M3 Pro has space black, which some of you probably don't care about that. It's a subjective topic, but I prefer the space black. I think it looks better than the silver or the space gray, but I think we probably need to mark a checkbox next to the silver finish because I've actually had to put a skin on my MacBook now because I'm already showing some wear and tear on the finish because it's starting to chip and scratch a little bit. And it's probably because I haven't been the most cautious person with it. I use this machine. I use it, which is what it's made to do. And I'm probably not as gentle on it as I should be. And my backpack is definitely not the most cushioned backpack. So I can see how I've probably chipped it over time, though I'm taking preventative measures now to hopefully mitigate some of that chipping and scratching. And part of that would be to put a skin on it, which I typically don't like. I think I paid a lot of money to make sure that the device is manufactured and engineered to look really, really good. And I hate slapping a sticker on it. I hate slapping a case on it. I always run my phone without any kind of case, just because I know I paid for that engineering. But still, I like the color of the space black. I think it's a good addition. It's something you won't find on any of the other older chips. So I do want to mention that here. The M3 Pro offers improvements on the M2 Pro, but let's stop there. Does that mean the M2 Pro is bad? No, they're all good. They're all really good chips. And really, if you isolated this, which is how you are probably going to use it, if you isolate any of these factors, probably not going to notice the difference. That's the thing I really want to hit home with, is that in isolation, which typically isn't done with these YouTube videos, people compare them next to each other. In your experience personally in isolation, it's going to be a non-issue because honestly, the difference between these machines from year over year over year isn't that insane that the user experience itself is going to change. I said in my original video that if your M1 Pro chip isn't cutting the mustard for you, you don't want to buy the M3 Pro because it's probably not going to cut the mustard for you still. It'll perform better. I got a noticeable jump from M1 Pro to M3 Pro, but if the M1 Pro wasn't doing it for you, you should get the Max chip. It's that simple. The Pro chips are not going to iterate over themselves annually like they did over Intel. And that's reasonable because they're high performing machines already. The CPU architecture is already really efficient and really powerful. So there's no reason to expect these massive leaps in performance because most users probably aren't maxing out the performance of their MacBook Pro. Let's just be honest. So after getting tons of questions on my last video about which MacBook to buy, which configuration to buy, I kind of summed everything up to about two questions that I think if I answer will give you enough clarity to make a decent decision and feel comfortable with it. So the first question is, what does it mean to use an Apple Pro chip? Now I dove into this with my iPhone review, linked uh, somewhere over here, if that's your cup of mayonnaise. But what I believe with the Pro chip is it means you're not going to question your performance for the next few years. I think the horizon would have to change drastically for your M1 Pro, M2 Pro, M3 Pro to start feeling like a dog in 2025, 2026. I think it's going to offer a great computing experience and it's going to stay out of your way in whatever workflow that you have for the next few years to come. But now if your horizons change, meaning your workflow changes significantly and you start doing something much more intensive, then yes, you might see a situation where 
upgrading to a Max chip would make more sense. It's very rare that your upgrade to a Pro chip would make that much more sense. And so I try to avoid hitting you with specs and benchmarks because to a lot of people, that stuff means nothing. And some people just wanna know, how is this device gonna change my life? And how is it gonna affect my workflow? Is it gonna do what I need it to do? And so that's why I make the statement, I think this device is making me a pro because it is staying out of my way as I navigate a creative or professional workflow. As I start to request things like, I wanna add a plugin or I wanna learn how to do this, the MacBook Pro will stay out of your way. Instead of hitting you with obscure metrics or benchmarks that you might not know or understand, what I aim to do is give you a real world benchmark, so to speak, where you can get true perspective and understand what this device can truly do for you. All of which you can see much of the results just by checking out my video quality from video to video to video on YouTube. And you can see how much it's improved just by leveraging this device. This shows you how the device is enriching my life with real world usage. This isn't coming from a tech reviewer that touches a laptop, talks about it for video, and puts it on a stack of other laptops to later compare to other devices. I am actually reviewing this laptop. This is my primary machine and I'm here to report that it's handled everything that I've thrown at it. And it'll probably handle most of what anyone else can throw at it. And while I do appreciate and respect what a lot of YouTubers and tech reviewers are doing with comparisons and specs and benchmarking, I think what it fails to do is let the end user really Realize that most of the stuff will be done in isolation and the incremental changes amongst the different devices is going to be rarely perceptible meaning my usage would be largely similar to one of an M2 Pro, for instance, which would easily handle the type of work that I'm doing today as well. Pro chip is for most people who dabble in professional work, but also the professional that needs performance. This is what it means to have a pro device, is that it's designed from the ground up to stay out of your way in professional workflows. That was the intention and function of the M1 Pro, and that is the intention and the function of the M3 Pro. It's why I continue to say there's imperceptible differences between those three chips. It's because they all share that same fundamental function. And why I always make sure to mention them because they're honorable mentions. So let's get to the second question, which was a question left by a commenter that I thought really sparked this video because it was the first time I had a question where I was like, huh, I never thought about it that way. But here it is. It says, out of curiosity, what features would Apple need to add to the MacBook to convince you to upgrade down the line, an OLED screen, a touch screen, a top of the line gaming GPU or something else? Or are you committed to sticking to your 10 year timeline, making your current laptop even more appealing? I think it's a great question because every time I purchase a device over the past few decades, I've always known what the next step was for me. I've always known what I needed next and that tech just needs to catch up to it. And when it does, that'll be my next device. And some of this I think might just be because I'm getting older or maybe tech really is getting that good. But to answer a few of those things, I don't really care too much about an OLED screen on a MacBook. I have an OLED screen right here and I have an OLED screen in the living room over here, but I don't really care too much about the OLED screen because I'm like, the screen on the MacBook is already insane. But the answer to the question ultimately is if gaming picks up on Mac and if Apple starts to approach their GPU performance against Nvidia like they did with Intel and CPUs then I might consider getting a new laptop in the next 10 years or so or whenever my upgrade cycle would be only then would that make sense but I would only upgrade to probably the top end chip meaning I'd probably get the max chip at that time and I would get rid of my desktop and get rid of my laptop and I would consolidate devices into one and that's only if Apple starts to fight off Nvidia the same way they fought off Intel and if video game developers started supporting Mac OS like they support Windows. That's about it. Outside of that, I said the likelihood of me upgrading my MacBook Pro with another MacBook Pro or MacBook in general would be very slim. As a matter of fact, the Vision Pro would have more of a chance of supplanting my MacBook Pro instead of another laptop because I live in a tiny house and the ability to have unlimited virtual displays would go a long way considering I'm limited to really one right now, which I use this as four monitors essentially just because it's denser and I don't have to deal with the bezels. It would be nice to place large screens throughout this house that don't actually take up physical real estate considering I own only have 399 square feet. But I think me owning an Apple Vision Pro probably is a long ways away. I would totally do one. I totally would love to purchase one, but I don't think the channel's there yet. It could be maybe one day. I don't know. You know, if this video got a ton of likes or, you know, a ton of subscribes or comments or something, if it got insane, I do have the capacity to purchase one if I need to. 
I will and review one with a real world review similar to the one that I'm doing right now. Like I said, I think that's kind of a long ways down the road. I don't really see myself needing the Apple Vision Pro right now, for instance, and looking at some of the stuff on it, I don't really think it's gonna be my cup of mayonnaise, but you know, hey, if you guys are interested in seeing it, maybe I could figure something out for y'all. You just let me know in the comments. Regardless, the M3 Pro is one of the first products that I've owned where I'm like, the form factor is pretty much perfect. It's exactly what I need. I don't need anything more. I don't need anything less. It works for me. And if I needed more performance in any situation, I'd be more prone to upgrade my RTX 3080 than I would be to upgrade my Mac. So I think really understanding the description of a pro chip and the fact that I don't see an upgrade path for me currently with this machine, those two factors should probably let you know that any one of these devices that you purchase, you're not really going to go wrong with. There are a few caveats to that. I do recommend at least getting 16 to 18 gigabytes of RAM. And in my situation, I got 36 gigabytes of memory, 512 gigabytes of storage on an M3 Pro. It's the 16 inch and so it's the larger screen, but that means that it also comes with the top end of the M3 Pro, which I also recommend that too. So anyways, if you like the content, click like. If you like me, click subscribe. If you have anything to say, leave a comment below. I read them all and I love talking about tech, so just let me hear it. Anyways, that's it for me. I'll talk to you guys in the next one. We'll see you later. Peace.